In the late 90s, PC gaming was in its infancy, and a lot of companies wanted to capitalize on this new trend and find a way to market video games to children. So they came up with the idea of making educational PC games. These games could be described as educational entertainment, or as they called it, edutainment. Very creative. And some of those games slap. You probably remember some of those games like Math Blaster that taught you some simple math, or the Magic School Bus games, or the Mario game that taught you how to type. These games are iconic. But what about the typing game that taught you all the swear words? You probably don't remember that last one, do you? That is the long lost game called Secret Writer Society that was supposed to teach kids how to write, but instead it taught kids every curse word imaginable. Now on the surface, it's obvious that this was some kind of bug that made it past testing, but the story of how it got there is far more interesting. It involves the surgery and mutilation of hundreds of Barbie and G.I. Joe dolls. To open Barbie, insert a screwdriver firmly into the joint at the base of the spine. A glitch that included hundreds of gay characters making out in the 1996 video game Simcopter, and the birth of an anti consumerism activist group that might have been behind it all. Our story starts with a little game company called Panasonic Interactive Media, who released a game called Secret Rider Society on February 10th, 1998. It was an edutainment video game meant to teach kids how to read, write, proper grammar, something that kids probably need today more than ever. Far right authorization on you on Alternalist, ultra, 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 oh my god, ultra analyst, anal, analyst. The game included a series of writing lessons and is hidden behind some cool graphic and makes you feel like you're joining a cool secret society of writers. If I was a kid, the game actually looks pretty cool. The copy of the game even came with a membership card, some spy-like decoder pens. However, behind all the cool flashy graphics was a pretty lifeless game with boring lessons that probably would have went unnoticed if it wasn't for the very final lesson of the game. About 20 minutes into the game, you reach the final lesson, which finally gives you some creativity and lets you write whatever you like. But of course, when faced with this new tool that will read out what you write, the first thing a child might want to write is, you know, butt, maybe even penis, maybe even a little bit of fuck. <laughs> So the developers needed a way to prevent this and coded a list of around 100 words that wouldn't be read out loud if the user typed it in. That was to protect our children from those dreaded naughty curse words. When faced with this screen, you press the blue read button and the program will begin reading out whatever you wrote. But trouble happens if you interrupt it by clicking read again. A G P N S P E N U S C S P N D U D I A R Y A U C K E R K I S A K U R C O. The bug would begin to say out the list of all the words that were supposed to be banned. It's a pretty hilarious bug that I could see getting glossed over. If you're a child, it's pretty funny, but probably not so funny if you're a parent. The first place to notice this bug was a review site called Super Kids, who quoted one parent as saying, "It was quite unnerving to be sitting in front of the computer and suddenly having this mechanical voice swearing at me, almost like something out of a slasher movie or something. It could really affect a child." Which is kind of a bit of an overreaction. Like, I get, you know, you're a concerned parent that suddenly had a video game shouting a bunch of profanities at your child, but it's pretty funny. You gotta admit it. But I can't imagine that being more traumatizing than calling your kid over while you're watching the movie Chucky, thinking it's a cute movie about a doll until Chucky starts stabbing someone. So you begin to cry, and then ever since then, you have a deep fear that Chucky is real and is gonna kill you. And then they buy a Chucky doll and then put it in your pillowcase. And so that way, when you go to sleep, you find the Chucky doll in your pillowcase. And now you're terrified that. Chucky's gonna kill your whole family, so you force your mom to throw away the doll, but then in the Chucky movies, the doll always comes back, so I'm basically living in fear my entire childhood that Chucky is gonna come kill my whole family. Now that would be a traumatizing incident for a child. Anyways, this was long before the days of being able to fix games over the internet, so Panasonic had to scramble to recall all copies and put out a fix, which took them nearly four months. But other than that, the game was largely forgotten. Nobody made a big hullabaloo about it, but thanks to the internet, some things never die, and this did get brought up again, and there's actually a connection to all this. Was it just a harmless bug that was overlooked, or is there something deeper to it? Hi, I'm Team Talk Barbie, the spoke doll for the B-L-O. This brings us to RT Mark, an anti-consumerist activist collective that was aimed to protect people and children against corporations, and they would pull some stunts and pranks to make themselves known. Their first prank that they claim to have done is something known as the Barbie Liberation Organization, or BLO for short. In the 1990s, a cultural war was taking place that often criticized harmful gender stereotypes. Barbie had released a doll that said, math class is tough. And by 1993, a common criticism is that the Barbie dolls portrayed a negative stereotype for women. There's no question 
question that there is a stereotype that exists for young girls, which is that math is hard. I can't do math. The BLO planned an elaborate stunt when they would swap out the voice boxes on G.I. Joe dolls and Barbie dolls. So we can't have a totally new voice. We can switch with G.I. Joe and other toys for boys. Now we say things like this. Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> and then they would be repackaged and returned to the shelves with a process known as reverse shoplifting. A pretty hilarious stunt. It's uncertain how many dolls were actually affected, but they put out this handy little graphic that showed details on how to perform the doll surgery and encouraged everyone to take part. Aside from buying a Barbie doll that has the gruff voice of a soldier, I think it's more alarming as a parent to buy a doll that was already operated on and put back in its box. Uh, that part just seems more creepy to me. They also released their own videos and kept a style consistent with nightly news segments that made it difficult to tell the difference between what was real and what was fake. The group also enlisted the help of friends and family to purchase the dolls and then contact the media, which gave the illusion that the stunt was bigger than it actually was. And the media went crazy over it. Which brings us to our next big stunt. While the BLO was an interesting prank, there's no solid proof that RT Mark was actually behind it. The group's beginnings and first verifiable prank came in 1996, which involved a little game called Simcopter. Simcopter was a 1996 video game developed by Maxis, who created the popular Sim series, spawning titles like Sim City, The Sims, and more. You're probably familiar with it, I don't need to explain it. Although plenty of other Sim games came before Simcopter, the game is notable for two pretty big reasons. Number one, it marks the first video game to include the Simlish language which became an important piece of sim lore. But it's a proving no. And number two, and more importantly, it featured an overwhelming number of shirtless gay men making out with each other. <laughs> Joaquin Servin was a low-level programmer working at Maxis who hated his job. Mostly due to poor working conditions, he complained about long hours, constant overtime, and low pay. But one of his biggest complaints was that his boss kept insisting that they needed to add more sexy women in the city walking around. You know, in a game made in 1996 where video games look like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, look at all those sexy pixels. In retaliation, he added secret code in the game with a rare chance to randomly spawn in shirtless gay men who would then start making out with each other and play loud obnoxious noises. This wasn't discovered before the game was published and the game was sent out and nearly 50,000 copies were sold with the secret coding installed. But remember how Joaquiz was a low level programmer? His code didn't exactly work as intended. What was only supposed to be a sprinkle of gay every now and then turned into a whole cake covered in gay sprinkles. It was like a New York City pride parade. Something that was only supposed to happen once in a while was accidentally coded to actually happen pretty much all the time. Joaquiz was fired for the stunt, which inspired him to start RT Mark and also the more popular group, the Yes Men. That could be a whole video in itself, you've probably heard of them before. His goal was to continue to do similar stunts to bring attention to underreported issues like what he faced at Maxis. So how is this all connected and why is this important? You see, RT Mark claimed to be behind the Secret Rider Society glitch and that they paid a programmer $1,000 to include the bug as a protest to parents that they shouldn't trust computer programs to educate their children. That was quite the sentence, but there's not really any verifiable proof of that. And the news of this didn't really go far and a new version of Secret Rider Society was released, brushed under the rug and the game went under the radar. Nobody really paid attention to it. But this story wasn't lost thanks to internet and game historian Phil Salvador who did an article about this bizarre situation and is also the one who uploaded the game to the internet archive for preservation. He also reached out to a member of RT Mark who admitted that they didn't actually have anything to do with the Secret Rider Society and they basically just claimed it as their own prank for the lols and it fit their narrative. And so the moral of the story is, if you're ever facing trouble at work or something's not going your way, just add in some gay to your work and you may go on to found one of the most influential activist organizations in the world. I think that's the takeaway from this story, right? I don't know, but it's pretty entertaining nonetheless. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please hit that subscribe button. I'm still new to this. I'm still trying it. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know. All right, well, uh, bye.